Hi, I'm Dr. Tavares. I'm um, current attending from Johns Hopkins. I'm here with Dr. Threlkeld. Hi, I'm uh, Zach Threlkeld. I'm a neurointensivist out at Stanford. Today, we're going to be um, reviewing a study published in Neurology Green Journal in March 2022. Um, the title is Cerebral Microbleeds and Acute Hematoma Characteristics in the Attached 2 and MISTI 3 trials. Um, so, this study looked at the association between the presence of cerebral microbleeds and both hematoma volume and expansion using um, patients who had MRIs from these two studies. Um, so, just a little refresher of what Attached 2 and MISTI 3 are. Um, they're both multi-center, open-label, randomized studies. Attached to is asking the clinical question in patients with spontaneous ICH with a volume of less than 60 cc's um, and a GCS of five or more, does intensive systolic blood pressure control with nicardipine to a target of 110 to 139 improve disability or lower mortality when compared to a target of 140 to 179? Um, and with MISTI-3, the question was um, in patients with non-traumatic um, supratentorial ICH with a volume of 30 or more does minimally invasive surgery plus um, image guided alteplase uh, improve functional outcomes after one year compared to stat standard medical treatment. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Devarez. And I'll uh, summarize some of the prior literature and, and talk about some of the methods that they employed. I think you already, highlight, already highlighted one thing that's really important, that they uh, pooled two very different studies and very different populations. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the limitations. But I think the question they're, they're trying to get at is, is an important one, which is what is the association between cerebral microbleeds and ICH volume, as you said, which has been very uh, difficult to pin down in, in prior literature. Um, and as someone who's not an ICH expert myself, it's been really interesting actually to look back uh, at what has been published about this as, as we read this article. Um, most of the studies before have, have been smaller, single center studies ranging from uh, less than 100 to at most about 400 patients um, and have found uh, very different, uh, very different things, conflicting findings. Um, the, one of the earlier studies in 2006 by Lee and colleagues found an association between microbleeds and increased ICH volume, uh, which I think would have been my hypothesis going going into this. Um, but more recent studies have shown with larger cohorts uh, of 400 patients or so uh, that there actually was an inverse association. So really trying to to increase the level of evidence and better understand what that relationship looks like, um, I think is the question that we're that we're trying to get at here. There was um, a, a paper by Shuamanish and colleagues that actually looked at ATAC2 in particular um, at this very uh, question and did not find an association. I think their p-value was was 0.5. So essentially did not did not find any association either way, but probably was underpowered. So I think it makes sense that you, the next step would be, well, can we can we increase the size of, of the pool and the number of patients to try to answer that question? And so one way to do that is by adding MISTI3, as you, as you just said, and that's what they've done. Uh, that's what they've done in this paper. Uh, so their, uh, their uh, inclusion criteria were patients in either ATAC2 or MISD3 who received an MRI uh, as part of their study. Uh, they looked at the uh, topography, so the distribution, the number, and the presence of cerebral microbleeds, and then explored associations between those and two co-primary outcomes, as you said already, ICH volume and then ICH or hematoma expansion. Um, they did look at uh, a number of secondary uh, outcomes uh, as well, uh, with uh, white matter hyperintensities, um, number of microbleeds, as I said, and is there any difference uh, between low bar and deep microbleeds, which may hint at underlying pathophysiology, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later as well, cerebral amyloid versus, versus hypertensive ICH. Uh, they controlled for all of the usual things, demographics, comorbidities, um, and they used a mixed effects uh, statistical model, which allows for the addition of a, a random effects term, uh, which re represents, uh, in theory, um, differences between the two studies. So if a patient is from one ATAC2 or from MISTI3, uh, in theory, we can biostatistically control for uh, those possible differences. I'm not a biostatistician by any stretch of the imagination, but I still think that's one of the one of the challenges of the study is is combining these two very different groups, but they've at least been very thoughtful in how they've how they've tried to approach that statistically. Um, with, with that, uh, maybe I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Tavares, and we could talk a little bit about what they found. Yeah, so 
Um, the cohort for the final analysis consisted of 466 patients um, from the total of 1499 patients, right, that were in the two trials. Um, there were 178 from the ATT2 trial and 288 from the C3. The majority of the cohort, you know, as expected, had deep hemorrhages around 67.1%, um, while about 32.8 had lower hemorrhages. So <clears throat> cerebral microbleeds uh, were present in about half the patients. And when the, within the group of microbleeds, the majority had about three to 10 microbleeds. Um, in the unadjusted analysis, the presence of microbleeds were associated with smaller baseline hematomal volumes. And um, I'm just gonna share some of the tables from the study so you can see that um, in the uh, multivariable mix effects linear regression model, this was adjusted for age, sex, race, um, hypertension, the location of the bleed and the baseline um, systolic blood pressure and leukoariosis. And there was a significant association um, with the presence of microbleeds and smaller baseline hematomal value. Um, and then you see again in the um, mixed effects logistic regression model that the presence of microbleeds was associated with lower odds of, of hematomal expansion. Um, and they actually found um, that this had an inverse dose response in relationship to the number of microbleeds in, in, and these ICH characteristics, right? So the more you had, the smaller the volume um, and the, uh, the less odds of expansion. Um, they also did a subgroup analysis and they saw, um, as you see here, that the presence of, of microbleeds was associated with lower odds of um, hematomal expansion if you were younger so over here, we see less than or equal to six years old if you were male. And also, um, as you see here, if you had a deep um, hematoma location, so. Yeah, so to recap, it sounds like the presence of microbleeds uh, was associated with smaller ICH volumes and actually decreased hematoma expansion. Um, and then I think, as you showed, the actual strength of that association is increased the more microbleeds that that are present. Um, what's your What's your initial reaction to that? Are, are you surprised? Does that fit with what you thought would happen? <laughs> what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I, I was a bit surprised because you know, you know, as you said earlier, there's lots of studies showing that we look at microbleeds. We know they're associated with bleed recurrence. We know they're associated with um, initial bleed, right? So how is it that something that puts you, that seems to put you at risk for this pathology then is somewhat protective in a sense. So um, especially what, what, from what our understanding is of the, of the pathology of what happens to, to, to vessels with um, small vessel disease, right? Um, and so I found it interesting. The authors actually said in their discussion that they thought that that protective, um, that protective ability was due to the vessel being just thicker walled. And so that's why they thought you didn't see as much expansion. Yeah, I saw that too. And I think that's a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting point to try to understand what's happening at the pathophysiologic level. Um, and they reference um, a really nice histopathologic study out of Steve Greenberg's group at MGH, um, which is focused on CAA patients specifically. Um, but where they show that the vessel wall thickness is actually larger in those patients who have uh, definitive, so biopsy proven amyloid. Um, and I, I, it's, I, it's hard to know for me, I guess, whether that can be extrapolated to patients who have presumably hypertensive ICH versus CAA. That continuum maybe is up yeah. for debate as to, as to really um, as how, how those are defined. But uh, I, think, I think that is an, an interesting um, um, proposition. I, I think we still don't understand really what the underlying pathophysiology is, though, and it is. Um, it, it, I think this highlights this, right? All the disparate findings that we've had tells us that we maybe really don't understand very well uh, what's underlying a lot of these processes. Yeah, there were definitely a few questions came up when I was reading this. You know, um, one regarding the the that CAA hypertensive bleed, like that underlying pathology, and then how we were able to distinguish right within this this cohort and. Um, the other thing was also, for example, um, anticoagulation, right? So we know that MISTI-3 accounted for it, where, whereas the other study did not, right, in their analysis. And um, so it makes you wonder if that also had any account um, 
within the final results. And, and also we talked about, I think earlier about the use of the different uh, MRIs, right? The 1.5T versus the 3T. Yeah, exactly. I think um, different field strengths and also they could have used different sequences, right? Some might have used a GRE sequence, others might have used an SWI sequence. We know SWI is a little more, uh, is more sensitive for detection of microblades. Uh, and there's actually a, a whole literature looking at, you know, even using like machine learning to understand, you know, what is a microbleed versus what is not, because it can actually be quite tricky when you really drill down. Um, so there's some sub sub subjectivity actually to assessment of microbleeds as well, which I think is, um, is not necessarily something they could control for here, at least with the way they've done this analysis, but I think it is a limitation also. Um, I, I still get, I keep getting fixated on this, you know, CAA versus hypertension. Maybe, maybe that's, um, maybe that's, uh, maybe I'm overstating that, but, but I agree. I wonder if, if there really is a difference there and, um, it probably would be hard. I don't know if they have enough history with each of these patients, probably not to be able to go back and say, you know, this person has possible or probable CAA and see if there's differences. They probably don't have enough, uh, uh patient level data to do that, but, uh, you do get that some hint of that, right? That I think you mentioned earlier that they saw that there was actually larger ICH volumes in patients. Uh, so among patients who had microbleeds, there was larger volumes in those who had only uh, low bar microbleeds versus those who had uh, deep microbleeds, which to me could hint toward that, although we know that's not a, a perfect indicator by any means of the presence of CAA. So um, yeah, I, I'm still a little troubled by that one as well. And I think one other thing that they could have looked at was uh, superficial siderosis, um, yeah, which definitely. you know would be an indicator uh, probably of, of a greater likelihood of CAA and would there be an association with ICH volume there as well. Um, that would have been interesting to see. I think, how do you think this study will you know, affect clinical decision-making and practice overall? Yeah. Um, it's hard for me to see. So as a neurointensivist, of course, I'm thinking in the first you know, few days uh, after after a patient with an ICH comes in, um, it's hard for me to imagine, um, at least with what we know now, you know, looking at this and saying, okay, if we have an acute MRI on somebody, which is you know, a challenge, I think, in a lot of places, first and foremost, but assuming that we had an, an acute MRI on everyone with an ICH who came into the hospital, um, you know, if I saw microbleeds, would that make me feel differently about you know, any aspect of their clinical care, would I feel comfortable downgrading them out of the ICU, for example, earlier with the presence of microbleeds? I probably not, right? I think that uh, we would need more evidence to, to be able to, to clearly have like a prognostic uh, or predictive uh, association with microbleeds. But I think it's, it's clearly the greatest, you know, level of evidence that we've seen around this association. And with all these disparate findings, this has certainly been, I think, the most definitive uh, statement of the association between microbleeds and, and ICH volume. So I think it's super interesting. Um, it's hard for me to imagine how it changes clinical practice immediately. Yeah. Um, but I also, we talked a little bit earlier when we were discussing about, um, you know, what does this tell us about how we, how we understand ICH? And I don't yeah. know what your, what are your thoughts on that? I think, I think there's still a lot that we need to learn about this, obviously, if, if we found these findings like that we discussed that weren't expected given what we know um, about how these microbleeds are associated with, you know, long-term poor functional action outcomes in previous studies and recurrence and, and incidence. So um, it's, you know, I think there's still a lot we need to learn at like a baseline pathology level, right? Um, and, you know, at the, I mean, at the end of the day, like findings like this are very important. I mean, we're, we're prognostication is, is um, very important in this population and it's challenging, right? We know that um, you know, when we admit these people, we use ICH score, but, but um, you know, there's been cohort studies that demonstrate that this score might overpredict mortality, right? Um, so, you know, again, you know, this presents that question, um, is this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So we need mm -hmm. to find kind of different markers. So is acute MRI at this time something that we can use? Probably not, at least with the microbleeds, but um, I guess it's a step in the right direction in finding different prognostic tools, right, for these patients. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think it's I think it's humbling. <laughs> um, just uh, you know, and I guess I wonder is there, you know, is there more to the classification of ICH as well? Um, it, it, you know, maybe a particular endotype. I'll use that word, but um, where it's not necessarily 
CAA and hypertensive and there's nothing else, but maybe there's some better way to classify these patients, a better way to think about them um, that would be more helpful clinically. I, I don't know the answer, but I think to me, this article really pushes uh, pushes that and says, you know, we don't really, I think, understand as much as we perhaps think we do about it. Um, the, the one other thing that we had talked about, which I think is important to mention, is just that uh, the interventions of the two trials would, in theory, affect the ICH volume as well. And so, um, in particular with MISTI 3 of course, we're actually endoscopically removing clot. Um, yeah. And so this was one of the first questions that I had when I was reading it. I was like, well, how could you look at ICH volume and ICH expansion when you're actually sucking out the clot as part of your intervention? Um, but if you look at the timing, most of the patients, um, so in this study, they used 24 hour CT uh, for ICH volume and ICH expansion. And most of the patients in MISTI 3 would have would have had their um, surgical removal of the clot well after that. I think on average, it was 36 or more hours. So probably that's not not um, much of a confounder, but it at least was something that came to mind. And I would imagine that others who are reading that would would think about that as well. So. Um, well, no, I, that was that was uh, uh, really fun to read. I think it, it uh, hints at a lot of ways forward that uh, perhaps we could study more to better understand ICH and the underlying pathophysiology. Um, more evidence, I think, needed to make a clinical change. And of course, there's the 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 dream that we could use uh, MRI acutely in some way to predict how someone's going to do not only over the next you know couple couple of days and weeks, but but perhaps even years. You know, what what does it tell us about their functional outcome as well? Um, and other outcomes that are important to patients. So, um, no, I really enjoyed this uh, this uh, paper, and it was uh, a pleasure to to talk about it with you today.